second day of this course. Um, the first speaker of this, uh, of this day is um, uh, Stefano Quintarelli. Stefano Quintarelli is an old friend, a trustee of the Nexus Center, like all other speakers uh, in this course. And um, Stefano Quintarelli is, uh, besides being a good friend, uh, has uh, several features that put them together makes him quite unique in the sense that uh, um, he's involved with the internet from, I would say, the very beginning of the commercial internet in Italy. He introduced the commercial offering of internet access in Italy among the first, I don't know the first, but among the first. Okay, the first. And um, so he, is, uh, he has seen many sides of the internet, including the business side from the internet access uh, point of view, but uh, is uh, not only that uh, uh, an entrepreneur in this field and in other related digital fields, is uh, also two, at least two, at least two other things. Is uh, uh, in a true sense uh, a digital intellectual, in the sense that he thinks about digital issues and um, deeply, as deeply as any scholar, so he wants to argue and discuss and understand the digital matters uh, with the uh, uh, level academics, the top level, or other people interested in these topics. So he's an intellectual, he yeah, also one of the most uh, followed uh, blogs on telecommunications and digital issues in general. Um, you just look for Stefano Quintarelli and you can find it uh, in Italian, but also with some contributions in English. And uh, also, for the last couple of years, he's also a member of the Italian Parliament. And is, uh, I think it's safe to say, is one of the few members of the Italian Parliament uh, with an understanding, a deep, real understanding of digital, digital issues. Not the only one, there are a few others scattered around. And together, this group uh, is trying to introduce some uh, smartness in the pol digital policies of the Italian Republic. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome Stefano back in Torino and back at the Politecnico. So thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Jesse. Hello, everybody. Uh, well, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, I have been told you have very different backgrounds. So it's quite complicated what are the topics I want to talk about today. And, uh, I will need to start from the very beginning, from the, from, from, from the network part. Uh, I don't bother you too much for those in, that are computer scientists or engineers. Thank you. I will be for mine. Thank you. Okay. So, I should talk about competition in the, in the internet and how in the internet space and what are the, the, the issues, the hot issues, the hot topics about competitions and uh, what might be an evolution. I understand that you come from different parts of the world. It's uh, quite complicated because uh, not all parts of the world have the same approach to competition and to regulation. Regulation is the basis of competitions, market rules are that are common funded through laws and uh, regulations and we have specific uh, governance systems that are different in the United States, in, in Europe, in Asia, in certain parts of Asia, uh, in certain parts you have common law, in other you have civil law and that changes a lot. So uh, it's not possible to cover this topic without having a month to discuss it. Uh, but I will do my best to explain to you what the issues are and how we are dealing with them in, in Europe. Uh, I will ma maybe make some reference uh, to the United States. Uh, and then of course Korea, Uzbekistan, etc. are very different, but you just have a feeling of what's going on in the world. Let me start from, from this. How many of you are familiar with the concept of network neutrality? Raise hands. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. What is the internet? The internet is a network of networks. The internet is interconnection of existing networks. 
At a certain stage in time, we decided that we didn't want to have a network with a central control because that would have been a target for uh, an attack during the war. So we wanted to have a resilient network, a network that is made up of different pieces and all these pieces can work regardless of having a, a single central coordination. And that gave birth to the Ethernet protocol. How many of you are familiar with the Ethernet protocol? Raise hands. Okay. Uh, uh, and basically, the Internet Protocol is the language that the computer shares, all computers share, in order to be able to communicate one another, computers, mobile phones, etc. All this stuff, everything in the long term will have a, an IP address. The IP address is the, the address how you refer to a computer, to a mobile phone, etc., to every single device on Earth. <coughs> it's like saying a telephone number, for example. It's something that we don't see normally, but it's coded in the, into the, each of these devices and they communicate uh, thanks to some protocols, some rules and so there is some kind of uh, path resolution so that if I want to talk to the guy with the red skirt at the, uh, at the rear of the, of the room there are different paths that can be traversed by the information I we, we exchange and so there is some kind of routing mechanism that routes this information from my IP address to his IP address based on IP addresses. So IP addresses are the fundamentals, like the telephone numbers, of the addressing system and of the routing system of the internet. And the internet is a collection of networks, so if that part of the networks goes down because of a war, because of a nuclear attack or whatever, as long as this part of the network works, I will be able to communicate with everyone that's still alive. This was the, 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 the fundamental of the birth of IP. And this, of course, th that was made the, uh, the decision to start the research on this, started in, in 1957, so a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, and, and, and the decision to, uh, of building such a network was funded by the military, because that was a specific strategic issue. Before that time, all networks had a hierarchical organization. So there was always somebody at the top that had a complete view of all the network and was able to route messages and traffic, data traffic, etc. And of course that would have been a target in case of an attack. But if you think, uh, now the telephone network, the telephone network has a, a, used to have a, a core system that have that, that define how the routing was done in all the pieces of the network. So that the phone network was vulnerable to, to, to a possible attack. But also, having this central control, you could ma mandate enforcement at each point of the network, at each part of the network. I mean, if you, if you control the network, the whole network, then you can say she will not be able to communicate <coughs> while on the internet. You need that the control is dispersed, enforcement is much, much more difficult. Much more difficult. Because as long as you can communicate, you will be able to do it. And then you have to do some, if you want to, to enforce certain policies, for example, restri restricting access to certain kind of content. On a traditional network, you would simply have excluded that content from the network. But on the internet, there are many paths, different paths to reach for that content, and so you need to enforce it at the endpoints. And enforcing at the endpoints, or what, the closest possible to the endpoints, means analyzing the traffic that is flowing on, on, on the cables and taking away the traffic, the, the traffic from, from the specific cables. So there is not a real uh, possibility of uh, a central authority and enforcement is much, much, much more difficult. Of course, this is good news for uh, places where you have uh, problems with freedom of speech and all this kind of stuff, but it's uh, also a problem uh, if you think about terrorism or so. So kind of new ethical issues arise because previously, in the former network, it was very easy. You had a central authority and the authority decided. Now there is no central authority. And then you have to decide where, where, and where freedom of speech ends and where uh, uh, and 
reinforcement, anti-terrorism, etc. starts. And, and then uh, you snoop into the network. You could not, you, you cannot exclude portions of uh, users. So it's not, everything is much more complicated. But that was just a quick overview. So basically, the internet is a collection of networks. I have four networks here. Connected to each network, you have computers, terminal devices, smartphones, mobile phones, whatever. Uh, and you have servers. I did servers with a cylinder. Computers request content uh, to servers and receive the content from the servers, regardless of, of where servers are placed. I told you there are different paths. So all these paths are good for one user to receive content from the server. <coughs> At a certain stage in time, uh, Tim Wu invented this world uh, network neutrality. Because if you control a portion of the network, there are different networks in any place. I mean, uh, in, a, in a single building, uh, you can have uh, two different users that are in the same building. Uh, and one is connected to one network and the other one is connected to another, uh, to another network provider, access provider. Okay. So, uh, if, if, if the owner of this network, if the owner of this network, the one who controls this network, is part of the internet, is more network part of the internet, of the internet, decides that this server has to be uh, uh, penalized uh, because he's not a friend somehow. This network can slow down the traffic of the data to this user. This network, when the flow of the data passes through it, it can be slowed down. And what happens? That if, if this is service provider A, a search engine, and this is a service provider B, and other search engines, for this user, this, uh, uh, this search engine would be very slow. And so this user would rather prefer to use this other, sorry, to use this other search engine, because this would be very slow. What I'm telling you is that the idea is that having the possibility to manage the traffic on a single portion of the internet, on a specific tiny portion of the internet, allows the one who is managing that portion to determine the experience of the users directly attached to it. Okay, so they have a control on uh, service providers and how these service providers will eventually thrive or fail because if this network slows down this very much, well, this guy is not going to have any customers from, from any one of these customers will not, be, will not go to the service provider. So the idea is that if you control the network, you can control part of the economy that depends on the network. And if you control parts of the economy, it, can, it means that you can uh, determine uh, some market behavior by the users. And we, of course, don't want, that. Don't, don't want that. We don't want that. We want that the market, that <coughs> we want services flourish or, or perish because they are good or they are bad. We don't want that. Uh, we don't want that some, somebody has the control of determining how the market will evolve. So if we have a neutral network, a neutral network means that all traffic is treated the same, that there is no discrimination between services, service providers or applications, etc. Uh, do you use Skype? Okay, everybody? Fine. Do you use Skype on your mobile phone? <coughs> no, why not? Why not? Who doesn't? Slow. Huh? Slow. And why is it slow? Because the network provider slows it. So that network is not neutral, okay? And of course, that, that determines, so 
what, what do you do rather than just call and just pay somebody else? Okay, that's it. And just pay. And you have to pay your your, your rental provider. So there are there are at least two kinds of discriminations. One is that the, that who manages the network, that one who manages the network, can decide that B is successful over A for his users. And another part of discrimination is that, that he can decide that you rather use his own service rather than somebody else. So that's competition distortion. So net neutrality is really about, on the first part, competition. If you have a neutral network that you don't discriminate, then you have an ex-ante way to uh, ensure competition guarantee competition. Do you know the difference between ex ante and ex post? Mm -hmm. uh, who, who, who doesn't know what ex ante means? Everybody knows. Okay. <laughs> then there is another issue. If the network is neutral, if the network is neutral, the idea is that you don't look into the packets. Of course, if this user communicates with this user, through this path, okay, all his traffic will not be snooped by anyone. If this network is the bad, is the bad guy, is the non-neutral one, he puts on devices, data protected analyzers, that look at the traffic and he can inspect the, tra the content of the packet and read what is written inside. So if I tell you I love you, then you will know. Okay. If I tell you let's vote against this one, you will know. So there are two issues about net neutrality. The first one is competition. And the second one is privacy. Right. In general, it's a matter of rights. Because the user has the right to use the circuit. In our view, I, don't, you know, I, I understand that it might not be the same everywhere in the world, but in our view, each user has the right to use the service he likes the most. And he's a, he's a right of the user. Each user has the right to privacy. And I understand that, that, that that's not necessarily the case everywhere in the world. But that's our culture. <coughs> and so we say that if the network is neutral, then privacy and competition are not going to be interfered with. Okay. Have we everything to hear about now? Yeah? Okay. Then there is another potential competition issue that is this. He introduces Skype acceleration as well. 
If you are a new subscriber, <coughs> to which one of the two networks are you going to subscribe to? The one where you have the chance of having most of your friends, right? Most of the people you talk to, because this part will not be accelerated. Okay? So you will subscribe to this one. In fact, in the long term, you will see a migration of users from the small network to the big network because that's where most probably your peers are when you need to talk. Okay, so scale in itself is a competitive advantage because, I mean, this is the same for example for eBay and other marketplaces. Do you use eBay? Okay. Uh, do you know, for example, Garage? Garage. 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 Yeah, it changed name recently. It's another marketplace. If you have something to sell, where do you, or if you want to buy something, where do you go? To Garage or, or to eBay? You go to eBay. Why? Because everybody is there and that your, chances, your chances are better. Right? Okay, that's the same stuff. So, if we have a neutral network and we cannot interfere with the traffic and all kinds of traffic are treated the same, <coughs> it will be a matter if you subscribe to this service provider or to this one. If, if you introduce the possibility of management, you will have a problem at the interconnection level. Because in order for this traffic prioritization not to be a competitive advantage of the largest upon the smallest, you will need to put specific regulations defining that these users must not be penalized in their experience because of the network management. So you will require that this portion is accelerated as well. Let's use the word accelerated to make it clear. Okay? So then if you have this provision, it doesn't matter if you subscribe to this service provider or to this service provider, and so the network management management will not be a discrimination lever, a competition lever used by uh, the service provider. This, this was slightly more complicated than the other, right? But did you get it? Okay, so network neutrality is about user rights, the possibility of choosing whatever content service provider internet service provider you want about privacy. Non-neutrality can be used as a competition between different service provider where the largest is favored. Non-neutrality. Uh, last Last point, very last. A case that happened recently in the United States. You have Comcast, you have Level 3, and you have Netflix. Do you know what Netflix is? Yes. Okay. Why do you know what Netflix is? You don't have Netflix in your country, then you don't need to significant marketing. So this is Netflix network. Comcast is what is called the, an eyeball network. A network where there are many eyeballs, many users. Level 3 is called a transit network. And there is AT&T here somewhere. <laughs> so, if you are Comcast, 
you do a single contract with level 3 and they will manage for you all the interconnection, interconnections with all IBOS networks in the state <coughs> or in North America, Canada, etc. So you don't have to you don't have to deal with a single uh, access eyeball networks uh, in, in in North America. You just deal with level three. You have a contract with them, and level three does all the interconnections for you. Level three connects to uh, companies <coughs> through a so-called peering. Peering is a direct interconnection with two networks. When you have network A and network B and they interconnect, that's a peering. It can be free, free agreement, or it can be paid. Because we're from Carlos to network, and have a network, and we have roughly the same users, then half of the traffic will be in that direction, half of the traffic will be in this direction. So eventually, from we will settle each other for free because I mean we don't care to pay. I pay him ten, and he pays me back ten. So it's pointless. At the central stage in time, uh, what Comcast did as a large portion of the traffic was a video from Netflix. Comcast did not upgrade its peering with level 3. And eventually, all the users of Comcast had a terrible experience and were not able to look at the video from, from Netflix. Until Netflix agreed to connect directly to Comcast and so Comcast, uh, Netflix was paying some dollars to level 3. Now part of these dollars went and this hearing was free because it was uh, and some of these dollars went directly to Congress. Uh, I'm not going to argue if this is right or wrong. One can have uh, different views on, on, on the issue. But the point is that This is also a type of non-neutrality. Neutrality is not something that is static, it might be dynamic. Because since the whole traffic increases. Uh, and uh, the interconnection of the networks is one key part of all the network neutrality and all the competition stuff. And it can be that the interconnection can be used uh, in a anti-competitive ways in order to leverage from one asset the number of the users in this network have, to force decision on other parts of the players. Very complicated. <coughs> okay. So let, let me recap. Competition, civil rights, net neutrality is an exact way to address these competition issues. Interconnect quality of service of service within a network. I call it the Skype acceleration. Is a way whereby the largest has an advantage over the smallest. So there is a regulatory issue there. Peering interconnection of networks plays an important role in ensuring that competition stays fair throughout all, uh, throughout all, all, all the internet. Okay, now, uh, as some of you are, uh, 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 I, I, I guess that you under, I, all of you understand that text is something that has a, a, diff, a very small limited impact on the network, audio has a significant in, uh, impact, images have a greater impact, uh, and the video have a huge impact. So effectively all these problems are booming because networks are now be, being able to stream com video content because when you remain to still images, well the load was not that much, but 
in the traffic, this is text, this is audio, this is images, and this is video. Okay, now, now the problem starts to be uh, sensible. If you are a service provider A, a search engine, you would be extremely frightened if there were some regulations in place that allow networks to discriminate in traffic because your business depends on how these networks behave this is a very important part suppose you are Google and suppose that all networks in Europe start to slow down Google Google will, be, will make no, no revenues in Europe anymore it will simply disappear so if you are Google you are very frightened of the, of, of the behavior of the networks. Between the, the eyeballs of the user and the service, there are a number of uh, rings in the chain, and the, 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 the ring of the, the network can be a bottleneck for the flow of the service. And if, 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 it, if, it, if it becomes a bottleneck, the service will suffer. This is why all the, all the service providers are so, do care so much about neutrality of networks. Because if networks are not neutral, they can be severely impacted and penalized. Because at the end, if, if, if the network decides who is going to pass, and who's going to pass well or not? Well, the other guys might disappear. It's like defining who can access, who can enter the supermarket or not. If you own the, if you control the street and you say you cannot enter that supermarket, that supermarket will close. So they, they care very much about network neutrality. Okay.
effectively we decided that they would not have any requirement on the competition level. They had some other requirements, but not for competition. And the idea was that that would have created the environment for these information services to grow. It was a political decision. Forward looking. Earlier, back in uh, 92, uh, in 92, uh, you probably were not born, but uh, we, we didn't have uh, uh, the, the internet was really, the, the, it existed, but just in some labs in the university, I was working with the internet in those years. And, and in, the, in 92, the regulations changed and allowed that there were the, the fact that uh, private operators could start to offer telecommunication services in Europe. In Europe, before 92, all telecommunication services were state-owned, state state-controlled monopolies. So you had Deutsche Telekom, which was owned by the Deutsche, the, the, German, the German government, Telecom Italia, it was called SIP, uh, France Telecom, now Orange, British Telecom, Telefonica in Spain, Portugal Telecom, state-owned monopolies. And we decided in 92 uh, that we wanted to have competition. And so basically you had, uh, we, we had, uh, this is the market, we had operators that had 100% one, of the market, and we defined some regulation just to have some private competitors, so to create a small competition space for private competitors that eventually would grow at least up, up to 51%. So we wanted to uh, uh, favor the birth of private operators to compete against the state of monopolies. At that time, mobile networks did not exist. <laughs> so we had just fixed telephony. So the idea we had in mind was that we needed to have some rules in order to favor this competition. Now, uh, you often hear uh, about telephone networks that you have a, a significant backbone. A backbone is really crap, it's nothing. If you consider, for example, let, let's take Italy, but oh, oh, everywhere is the same. The, uh, a backbone that goes from Turin to Sicily would be about, I don't know, 1,500 kilometers of fiber. Okay? And you go from Turin to Sicily. To this core network, to this backbone, you have strings attached that, end, that enter each body, each, everyone, everyone, everybody's house. In Italy we have about 22 million lines and the average distance from the core network, the backbone, the backbone to the house is 1.5 kilometers. Okay? And we have 22 million of this. And these are, well, these might be laid next to the railway, for example, or highway. It goes from north to south. It's very easy to dig. This is in old cities, old towns. And you need to dig extensively. And you have that, therefore, you have about 30 million, 35 million kilometers of access network. 35 million kilometers of access compared to maybe 2,000 kilometers of backbone. So the backbone is really nothing. It has no impact. The value of a telecom, of a telecom is its access network. You understand the difference in scale. 2,000 kilometers 
against 35,000 million, 35 million. And so if you are a competitor and you want to lay a new access network, it's something that is extremely expensive. The existing network was built when companies were state-owned mon monopolies and they had special rights and the state paid for all that. And all the, the, the lay down of that cable is already uh, paid for. You, know, you just have now have operating expenses to keep it lit, to keep it going. Electric power, maintenance, but that's... If you, if, you, if you want to compete against that and you have to lay your network, it's impossible. Because the cost is huge. You have to dig in each street of each town of the country. Well, that of course might depend. In Italy that is certainly so. If you go to the United States, you can attach the cables to the poles, and then the houses of the states are made with uh, wood, so you just have to drill to pass a cable into the, uh, into, into the wall, through the wall. Uh, Italy is much more, Italy, Europe in general is much more complicated. Not every place in Europe, because Germany was destroyed during the Second World War, and therefore it was rebuilt, and they rebuilt it with all the cities having uh, pipes in it where you can easily drag in the copper of the network or the fiber. Okay, so the lay down, laying down a network in Germany is significantly cheaper than, than in Italy. Then France, is, the population is very concentrated, it's concentrated in the south of France or around Paris. So once you dig in those two areas, you have maybe 80% of the population covered, while Italy population is very sparse, or Portugal population is quite sparse. In the UK, more or less the same, like France. So every, every country is different. It's different you know, because of uh, the mountains. So in Italy we have two mountains, one the Alps and the Apennines go down. And it's very complicated. Well, in, in France everything is flat, except for... So every, every place is very different. Every place is very different. But as a general rule, we decided that in order to be able to create competition in the telecom market in 92, we needed to have regulation whereby the monopolist, the state-owned monopolist, would have an obligation of renting its, its access network to other players, to newcomers, because otherwise they would not have been able to build this access network. Okay? So basically we said, listen, you are the monopolist, you own the network, we want more competition, you must provide her a competitive alternative, access to your network on wholesale prices. So you take away all, all avoidable costs, billing, bad debts, service, care, maintenance, etc. And we take away the cable that goes to this house and we attach it to her backbone. Okay, so we introduce some asymmetric, example, pro-competitive <coughs> rules in order to open the market. Because otherwise it would not have been open. This was typical <coughs> of Europe. It didn't happen in the States. Uh, and as a matter of fact, if you go to the United States, instead, except for large cities, where you have pipes, where laying a network is very cheap, generally you are not going to have more than one network. Fixed, fixed network. Completely different situation for mobile networks. Mobile networks are really fixed networks where you have the antennas. It's the people who is moving, who is mobile, it's not the network. But you have a network connecting all mobiles and, and the last mile Effectively, it's the last mile or so called last mile or local loop. Last mile or local loop. <coughs> this 1.5 kilometers string that goes into the houses. The, the last mile is wireless. Okay. And these were, start, all of them started in 93 94. So there was no established monopoly to fight with. So we didn't need to have asymmetric regulation on mobile because everybody was starting at the same moment. We needed to have asymmetric regulation on fixed because in fixed we had already monopolies and we had a bottleneck facility, something that could not be replicated by new entrants. Okay, 
I started with very easy terms and I ended up with competition law terms. Okay, so we decided to have a symmetric for competitive regulation in this market, in this network, in this telephone market, because we have an essential facility, the access network, that was a bottleneck facility where other operators needed to pass through and it was not a replicable facility. So think of it. We wanted to have information society services because they have it's a knowledge intensive stuff and it has low impact on the earth. Boom, period. And we favor that with a, a soft regulation. On telco, we had a very strong regulation because we needed to build, we wanted to open market for newcomers. Completely different mindset. Now, other, uh, the, other strong significant regulations we had in, in, in the telco industry, if you think about the telco, telco is a fantastic building machine. Uh, a telco has the relationship, a telco knows everybody that you talk to. Through the network, all your conversation pass. And so you can tell whether you talk for with Juan Carlos for conversation, very brief conversations, or with her for hours. Then you might prefer something different in the kind of relationship between the different persons. You have a deep knowledge analyzing the metadata of, of the conversations. If you own the network, you know where he is located and where she is located. You have to pay me. He has to pay me. And the network provider, and therefore I can bill, I can bill him, and uh, an invoice uh, and obtaining the money. So I could eventually sell him over stuff. Telcos were in a very strong position because they knew the social network, the position of the of the people. They had typically a direct access to their pockets, to their money. And why didn't they exploit that? Why didn't they become the PayPal? Why didn't and, and sell everything? Why didn't they become the Facebook or the MySpace of the situation? Because we had strong regulations that were uh, deriving from uh, effectively, effectively from uh, our fear we had from the Second World War. Very strong regulation about privacy. We wanted to protect the banking system. Banks are the payment intermediaries. And we didn't want that banks, that telcos could be, could erode part of the business of the banks. And we did and we prohibited telcos to become payment service providers until 2000 and something. We prohibited telcos to look at the data of the traffic of the people. We have very specific regulation, so-called data retention regulation, imposed by private privacy authorities. Which says that I can keep the data about Juan Carlos just for the time needed for the billing purposes. So I, I keep it for three months because that's a maximum period of time. And in these three months, he could have already paid me, or he maybe uh, has uh, opposed against one of my deals, so I have to keep the tracks, the logs, for, for two or three months. After that, I must anonymize it, so that I don't have any reference to him, and I just and, and handle the data only in aggregated form, so I need to aggregate it, just because of network performance analysis. And after two years, I have to throw everything away. So we have significant regulation imposed on telcos because we feared of, of privacy. And we feared of privacy because we had the massive, the fascism, the massive, the fascism, and uh, the Stasi in East Germany. And, uh, and it's not, it, and it's not uh, okay, I mean, it, it, it is for this reason that in, in, in the European Treaty, we have uh, the dignity of the person as one of the core values, of the main values, and, and it comes 
way before the freedom of speech. While in the, in the US they have the freedom of speech and they don't have the, the issue of the dignity, they never had a war in their territory. They never experienced, experienced these kinds of stuff. So we have a very significant cultural difference at the, at the root of these decisions. Well, eventually things went very, very well. We have, we have competition in the technical space and uh, uh, information services had grown and uh, had tried and so everybody should be happy. If, if it was not by the little fact that none of the big players in the information services are European, they are all Americans. Do they have better retention laws in, uh, in the US? No. Do they have privacy regulation in the US? No. In the US, so in, in Europe, well, they have some kind of. In Europe, uh, privacy is a fundamental right of the person. In the US, privacy is a commercial issue. So, uh, I made a contract with you. In this contract, I can state a more or less whatever I want. If I fail to that contract, it's a contract dispute resolution. So, it's the Federal Trade Commission that goes into that. In, in, in Europe, privacy is something that we cannot sell. It's a fundamental right of the person. So completely different rules. And completely different regulation. Soft regulation for information services, asymmetric pro competitive regulation, no economic regulation on <coughs> information services, economic, pro competitive, asymmetric, example, regulation for telco. Let's give this. Quanto abbiamo ancora? Ancora 25 minuti alla fine della lezione. Se poi potete ancora usare 5 minuti. Ok. Last time I did the lesson here in Polytechnico last year. Uh, I, ju I just covered this slide for one and a half hours. <laughs> so, uh, that because they said that you have to stop. Uh, because I can, I can talk on this slide for about an hour. <coughs> I'm not going to, to, to stress you that much. Mm -hmm. This is what I call my sieve, mio setaccio. Okay? It's the way how I analyze our things. Uh, and the difference between digital and uh, so immaterial and material stuff. Uh, do you play Scrabble? Some of you play Scrabble? Do you know Scrabble? You play Scrabble? Where's hands? I play Scrabble. Okay, do you play Scrabble with uh, the, the wood Scrabble or the plastic one? Plastic. The plastic one, okay. Who, are, who else plays Scrabble? Plastic. Plastic, okay. And none of you plays on, on a tablet, on, on a phone. You don't, you play what, what, what do you play? Um, there was this game. Bad words. I, uh, angry words. Yeah, okay. angry words. Yeah, good. I play angry words, so if you want to, to to play against me, let me look for Queen Stefano Vintarelli on Facebook and then you can. Uh, <coughs> uh, I'm an avid, uh, avid uh, Scrabble player and I, use, uh, and I play with the uh, Angry Words version of it. You see, uh, on, on the material, in the material world, it's, we have 10,000 of, of years of history in the material world once we settle and we start with agriculture. We started agriculture, we defined private property, we had enforcement for private property, markets, everything has evolved from the fact that we started to cultivate stuff. And things are so evident and so obvious that we don't see them anymore. I mean, producing costs a lot, reproducing costs significantly, archiving, storing in warehouse stuff has a cost. Moving meets the moving items from one part to the other require time, it costs money. You have people involved with the stuff. Yes, you can have some robots and robots are going, but mostly for much 
very much standardized stuff. And people tended to work during, not everywhere the same, but tend to work, I mean, at least you have to sleep and eat, so you cannot work 24 hours a day. Uh, it, on the immaterial side, and I don't call it virtual because it's not virtual, it's very real, it's immaterial. Producing costs, but costs much, much less. So, Angry Words is a game uh, written by two guys in Spain. In Spain, the company is called uh, uh, Ethermax. Uh, the game originally was called Apalabrados. And, and I don't know how many million users they have. Certainly, a number similar to that of Mattel playing uh, uh, to the ones who they sold the, the, the plastic version of Scrabble. Then, reproducing has no cost, has a zero marginal cost. Uh, archiving, storing has a zero marginal cost. All these costs are falling uh, exponentially. Okay, so basically, who cares? I made a talk, well, okay, um, let's not look into much detail. Uh, transferring does not require time. Basically, from here to Australia is 250 milliseconds, a quarter of a second. <coughs> okay, so it's certainly different than, than bringing a plastic box from uh, Hong Kong uh, to, to, to Turin. And uh, transferring does not require, does not come, does not require time. The manipulation of the data is done by machines. And uh, machines don't need to sleep or eat. They keep eating all the day, but they don't need to sleep. So it's a completely different, it's a completely different dimension. And I call it dimensions because they are not alternative one to the other. Like length is not alternative to depth. Everything has a length and a depth. Everything has a material part and a material part. Uh, in, in, in this mobile phone, you have a, a significant material part that maybe can impact for about, I don't know, 50, 10, 12 euros, the material part, and the other 290 is the immaterial part. But even if you buy this shop here, this has logistics attached to it, it has commerce, it has support, invoicing, and all this stuff. This part has also significant immaterial part. Probably most of it, or of, the, of the price of this stuff, most of it probably is immaterial. Even those we regard as immaterial. So, an immaterial can substantially integrate material things and can eventually substitute material things. Think of Scrabble, it's substituting completely. I don't care if it's plastic. I prefer not being plastic, as a matter of fact. I play in Italian. Uh, or Spanish. Uh, uh, I'm not even in English to, to be able to, to successfully play to, 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 um, to Scrabble. So, uh, and I, I do it because I play with some guys that are in. Uh, I have uh, one of my uh, Scrabble friends uh, in, in Spain, an Italian who moved to Spain to open a, a restaurant in a nice place, and uh, another one in Argentina. So, in the immaterial dimension, the world becomes a point. Everything, everywhere, always, instantly. So that means that competition is local, competition is fragmented, competition is slow, competition is global, competition is fast, Competition does not have any barriers to consolidation, to not being fragmented. Remember what I told you before. We have two different kinds of regulations. Information services. No, no economic regulation. No, in, no uh, limits on the scale or the size or whatever. Telcos. You have 100% of the market. We want to cut you in chunks so that we can create space for the others. Okay? 
And here we have, on this side, we have the perfect in ingredients to build services that in a very short time scale, scale to, in a very short time frame, they scale to world dominance with zero marginal cost. So basically, if you invest every one single pop, then you are done forever. So it's completely different beast, very well regulated, 10,000 years of history. This really started when ADSL, so always on connectivity, ADSL and 3G started back in 2001. So 14 years of history. 10,000 year, years, not very regulated, 14 years, very little regulated, almost no regulation. Regulated on different things. Then, reality and excludability. Reality means that a, a, a good is rival when either I have it or he has it. And if he has it, I don't have it anymore. That's rival. Material goods are rival because just one entity at a time can have, can have access to the, can use that one. Excludable means that a policeman comes and neither I nor him can have it. The old private property is based on the fact that goods are rival and excludable. The foundation of our laws are because material goods are rival and excludable. All of our system has been developed based on the fact that we live in a material world, like Madonna said, world where you have reality and explainability. And so a book, I was looking for a book, there is no book in the universe. But this is silly. Do you have a book? You don't. You don't. You don't. Any, anyone has a book? No, okay. Tell me that book. So this book is has two dimensions one material and one immaterial. But the, the fact is that the immaterial part of it is adhered, tied to the material one, and so inherits the properties of the material dimension. This means that it is rival and it, and it is excludable. And therefore, I can have it or she can have it. Okay? Therefore, I can have a regulation. If I am the seller, I don't care because both of us want one, we will have a copy, we will buy another copy. Okay? So I attach the right to the property, the right to give away, to make a gift, the right to resell. Okay? But what happens when we move away from the material and we move to the totally immaterial? So the scrabble of the book, obviously, an e-reader with a, a, an EPUB file or a PDF or whatever. Yeah, that, that, that's not, that's not rival and non-excludable. And so you don't have property anymore. And a book is not a book. We don't have the words to describe what it is. We call it an e-book. But what is an e-book? An e-book is a service. It's a service between myself that uses that content and the one that provides that to me, and we have a contract between us and him, between me and him, and him. And that contract state, states the uses I can do with that. And I cannot give it away. I cannot make a gift. I cannot resell it. Because that is excluded from the contract. So in the, these transformations, some rights that were very, very, that were very well defined for centuries are disappearing. And we don't have the words to describe this. I have a daughter, she's 15. A couple of years ago, I gave her, oh, I bought her all Harry Potter's books. Okay. Except the last one. The last one, I bought it for her as an e-book. And she, after reading the books, she, she always gave it to Francesca, her best friend. And I said, you do a very nice thing, giving, uh, making a gift of this book, a present of these good books to your best friend. And then when she read the, 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 the e-book version, she said, well, how do I 
give it to Francesca and I say, you can't. Well, you can, effectively. I, I, I can work it out, but if we do, that's, uh, that's a crime. How come if I give her a book, that's a good thing to do, and if I give her an e-book, that's a crime? Explain it to a 14 year, 13 years old girl at that time. No? And, uh, it's so moving from material to immaterial is completely changing the rules of the game, economic, but also the society. And people doesn't notice. Okay, then we have returns. In, in 1798, Malthus wrote an essay about the, uh, the world population. No? He argued that population was limited and you know, we were all bound to destruction because there was no possibility of, of feeding the whole planet uh, because of decreasing returns. Because, I mean, none of us is silly. If you, if you try to grow up some crops, you do it in, in the best land at the beginning and then you move to the worst one as you, as you first use the best one. So for one unit in input, you have one unit in output. Then as time goes by and, and you go to the worst land, you will need more than one unit in input in order to have one unit in output to grow your vegetables. And that will, so, and we introduced the concept of decreasing returns. And that goes in all the county. And it started in 200 years, 200 years ago, in 1798. So 217 years ago. 10,000 years of history of agriculture, of starting to define private property, rights, blah, blah, blah. And of this 10,000 years, 200 years, after 9,800 years we understood that were, there were decreasing returns. In 1994, Brian Hart, Santa Fe, wrote an essay, and the title is uh, uh, Increasing Returns and Path Dependence in the Economy. And it was the first time to, to the best of my knowledge, that uh, somebody said that uh, in, the, in a certain kind of goods, immaterial goods, that have a significant immaterial component, uh, dimension, sorry, you have increasing returns. And, and it's obvious. Think of eBay. I told you about eBay before. Think of eBay. Acquiring the first customers on eBay is very hard. Now, if you want to buy yourself something, I and mean, you go to eBay, it's obvious. So the cost of acquiring a new customer for eBay decreases over time. And the value of the system increases over on the time. On over time. Cost of acquisition, value of the platform. Why is this? Because of the value of networks. There are some formulas, Metcalfe formula, or this gold one, that define what is the value of a network that has n nodes. The value of the network is proportional to n squared, to n squared log n, to there are different uh, ideas of how to measure it. Okay. This uh, has an interesting consequence. In the material, so productivity, highest productivity, highest productivity at the beginning and then goes down. The consequence here is that I need to be get big very fast. Because if I get big very fast, I will be in a position whereby an en a new entrant will have a significant cost to acquire a new customer. The more time passes, the highest the cost will be for a new entrant because I will have be having network, a significant network effect. So when you start, when eBay started, if uh, after two months somebody else started, it would have just a two months advantage. And this two months advantage maybe it would have meant uh, a certain number of thousands of users. Now it is, it is hundreds of millions. It's impossible. 
following one to another. That has an implication. Beta service. Launch it as fast as you can because the issue is grabbing the largest chunk of user. Because if you are able to grab the users and to have them on your platform and don't go away because they need to be there, eBay, Facebook, then uh, switching is very difficult. Okay, I will skip the others because I will speak too, too, too long. This set of ingredients of my sieve in Mosetaccio are being exploited in two ways. The first one is interoperability. I told you about the different regulations of the telco industry. Exante, exante, asymmetric, asymmetric, pro competitive, competitive regulation. These were access to the sensor facility, so called uh, local mutual bundling, and then the others, but this was a major one. Local loop combining. Okay, another one is number of portability. What is number of portability? You all know what number of portability is the fact that you can move your number from one end to the other. Why is that? Why is that? Because if I have a telephone number and I give it to all my friends and I, have, and I want to change my operator and I cannot move my number, I will have to tell everybody that I changed number and therefore it will be very unlikely that I will switch. I will have a high switching cost. Okay, So number portability is related to contestability of the user. And we invented number portability. Tech equipment didn't provide the idea number of portability by politicians decided that it was a good thing to do because there are a lot of competition with the software of the switching equipment of the telcos that evolved in order to have number portability. Portability. Then they had interoperability. Interoperability. Interoperability is uh, the stuff I have to learn here. The fact that we must exchange traffic and that peering is not used in an anti-competitive <coughs> way in order to favor the largest operator over the smaller ones. Okay. Interoperability. And then we have interconnection obligation. If you have a network, you cannot refuse interconnection to another network. If you want Skype acceleration, you cannot refuse to interconnect with Skype acceleration to the other. Okay, we have this kind of regulations of Tesco. While in the information society service, I told you we didn't introduce economic regulation. And we don't have all this kind of stuff. So if you are Facebook, for example, uh, do you know Pandora? No. Somebody does. Okay. The idea is that you can have a profile and a social network. And you apply that, your profile to the social network. And the two things are detached. I mean, uh, think of email. You have an email address and you have a service provider, right? You have an email storage with all your emails and you have your email provider. Maybe sometimes it's integrated, the storage of your email with the, your email provider and the user interface to your email with your email provider, Gmail, it's integrated, Yahoo Mail is integrated, sometimes it's detached. I use KPN Quest email server and I use Thunderbird and my storage for my email. So it's not a technical problem separating the profile of the user from the provider of the service. It's not a technical problem, it's a decision. It was not 
it was a technical problem detaching the, the telephone number from the network. But we built software in order to enable that. We don't. So we have regulation in order, if you, if, if you have a telephone number attached to the network, you cannot move your telephone number from one operator to the other because it's attached to the network. If you detach from the network, you can move your telephone number to another network and then you have possible competition. Now we have the profile of the user completely integrated into the application, in the social network application. It, we could easily, easily, we could detach it and have it, a profile that works with different social networks. The fact that it's integrated is because we didn't have in the information services pro-competitive regulation because we decided not to have in order to make them flourish and, and grow fast. And they indeed did. So, interoperability is a key point to competition. If you don't have interoperability, services become silos. Email is fragmented. There are hundreds of thousands of millions of email servers around the globe. There are few social networks. If you would start a, the suppose email does not exist and you start it today, how do you start it? By writing uh, the protocols between the servers, the language that the servers talk with, the client that interacts with your server, an addressing schema so that you can have, or you build it as a web application where everybody must come in. The second, you do the second, you do a web application where everybody must come in. Then you pour one billion dollars in advertising and marketing, you bring a lot of users, you achieve a, an economy of scale, everybody, if I want to talk to her, well, I have to go there. Something that we prevented in the telcos, we don't not preventing it here. You have to achieve an economy of scale, you have the right to world dominance, Zero marginal cost, you are done forever. And this is the reason why venture capitalists pour, I don't remember how many billions into WhatsApp, a company that does not make revenues. Because who can? We are conquering parts of the world. Revenues might come eventually afterwards. Somehow we will cover costs. Okay. So interoperability is a key is a key to competition. And it's something that if you don't have it and you have a, a smart service in mind, venture capitalists will give you a lot of money. Another, uh, this is a, a fishing device. It's a cage. You put some food in the cage. It's very easy for the fish to enter. Once he enter, he's entered, he can never get out. Okay? Just click on here, log in with Twitter. Very easy to enter. Everybody is there. You cannot get out anymore. This is called user lock in. Okay. Number portability. Profile portability would be number portability is a profile portability would be keys against the lock ins, tools against the lock ins. So pro competitive tools. If you have something that has an idea that has significant network effects and significant locking mechanisms, just go pitch it to a venture capital and you will get a billion for that. Because that, those are the ingredients to world domination. Okay. And of course, if you don't have the friction, the material world, things start exponentially. What does it mean that exponential is this? Okay, this is exponential. You know the tale about, uh, uh, about the one who invented the chess. One, he went to, the, to this king and said, he went to the chess, and he said, how, how much do you want me to pay? Uh, one rise, one piece of rise on the first, one on the second, four, eight. Said, but are you sure that you want something really? Well, I mean, there is not enough rise in the world for, because exponentially means that once you notice, it's too late. Things have, things have already happened. Uh, some effect of this, uh, of the fact that the immaterial grows exponentially, and that electronics develops with uh, 
exponentially reducing costs and that transferring does not require time, does not cost, archiving does not cost, etc. Some effects is that uh, we are used to, to live in, in, in a material world. We are you know, used to be in a material world, but the immaterial dimension has become the user interface of the material dimension. And for you, it's, it might be even more true than for Makarov or, or me. I mean, we do everything through an immaterial interface. From buying a concert for, buy a ticket for a concert, uh, looking at your uh, exams data or your anything. Travel, shopping, you do everything through that. And if you have some gatekeepers that control, remember I told you about the chain and the and the, the, the telco providers being one part of the chain and the others fearing that they used this control of this ring of the chain in order to squeeze them out of some businesses. No? This example here. Okay. Once you are in a position in the chain between the user and the service and the good and the product, and you are in one of these, and you can exercise your monopolistic power in that range in order to condition the behavior of the user, you can shape the market. And net neutrality is about this. It's an exact regulation, an idea of exact regulation, in order to prevent the fact that somebody uses network management, network traffic, in order to squeeze out. But then we have other intermediaries that are in this chain that have this power. Maybe it's not the case with you, but it's certainly for me. We used to think about computers in a way, about the internet, in a way of many services and you can reach any service and you can use any service you want. But that not, that's not much the truth for most of humanity now. Because for most of people, the internet is Facebook, period. Or Google, and they don't have the difference, they don't, can't tell the difference between the address bar and the Google search bar. Okay? For many people, that's the internet. For many people, the possibility of installing any software you want, having your, the software you want from any source you want, writing your own software and, write, and, and putting it in your computers, is still possible because most of us use mobile devices where things that are installable or removable are decided by the gatekeepers that control this ring in the chain, which is the user interface, is becoming the user interface to the world. You are going to put all your payments here and they are going to terminate. And the fact is that we have moved from an interoperable internet where you have many servers and you started building services by building a server, building a client, defining the protocol, and having anybody having a, a server and interacting with the server, etc., to building silos, closed silos. Okay? And we move from a, 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 a world where you could write software, put your software, you don't like it, you take it away to something that you have to go and you have to submission, and after two weeks they tell you, no, you have some tits on that application, I don't like it. And they are imposing the load that is above state loads. Yeah, almost finished. So intermediaries, enablers, enablers, computer, the network were enablers, and thanks to this evolution, they have become intermediaries. And they ask for a percentage of the transaction. 15 basis point, basis points in transaction payments, 30% uh, for application of content on Apple software, and other, or 25% for booking, uh, and, and this is it. So effectively, when we talk about battery neutrality, we just focus on one tiny portion of the, of the thing. We should look at a broader picture. A picture whereby, from between the good service and the user, you have a, a, 
a string of intermediaries, and all those have the possibility of exacting a monopolistic rent based on the dominance they have on the customer, and we address pro-competitively just the portion of the network. And my argument is that we should look pro-competitive to the other portions of the service. We have last concept. In, 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 in Europe and uh, pretty much in the States as well as in Japan and Korea, we have two sets of regulations. One is the communications regulation and the other one is the antitrust, the competition regulation. The competition, uh, communication authorities work on what very well defined statically defined communications only, so network only markets with exact regulation pro-competitive while competition authorities, antitrust, work on dynamically defined markets. They just see case by case if you have a dominant position and then I can sanction you if you misbehave. In, and, and they intervene ex post on misbehaviors with sanctions. The issue is that this working example, like we would like from network neutrality, has immediate effects. This working ex post means that you need to detect the behavior, instruct the case, have the case, make, us, make the decision, and then you have appeal, and the federal level appeal, so it may pass 10 years, 7 years before sanction, before, before the moment in which the company mis misbehaves and the sanction. And when they say, okay, we reach a conclusion, you misbehaved seven years ago, I will put you a fine on your behavior of seven years ago. Who cares? Seven years ago, I was in uh, Nano, thank you. Now I'm a giant picker, I will pay the fine of that. So it's an incentive to risk misbehaviors. Because if I succeed, who cares? I have to pay very little. If I don't, I have failed, but who cares? I'm not going to be around. So my position is that we need this, this framework is not suitable to address that competition issue, that was the argument of this talk, that we have in the chain, because we just focused on one part, and over time we have completely diverged from the model of the internet, of the computers, we had one time, once a row. We have diverged, now we have silos, we have monopolies, we have non-interoperable stuff, we have users locking, which is completely different, and it has players that can exact a monopolistic top of their position. So, that's it, I'm done. Which human rights 
we have to protect on the internet and giving that as an input to the parliament in order for the parliament uh, to make all the laws that are related to DASTA following these principles. Uh, so you're right, it's two different things, but the one is needed for the other. Next question. So if you don't have questions, that means that I have been exceptionally clear or you have another new student in the world. So. <laughs> The, the government would uh, quite easily ask data to their cause for the uh, investigation would pose. So instead, uh, to the content providers like Google and Facebook, which is the extent to get privacy data for such good causes. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, human freedom. You cannot violate human freedom unless it's decided because you commit a crime. So principles are general and then they are defined by exceptions. So privacy is a right unless you use that privacy to commit a crime. Then you have and then you have some warranties about you can, what you can do and what you cannot do, and the fact that the retention law I mentioned before, so that you can keep the data in a certain way for a certain number of time, for a certain period of time, etc. Uh, the fact that the world is becoming more and more immaterial is, and the, 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 the things change are putting some pressure on what we mean, for example, by uh, lawful interception and by seizure. Because in the material dimension, in the material dimension, seizure is very clear. I, I go to your house, I give you a notice. And then I enter your house, you can look and you cannot touch anything and I take away what you see what I do. If I do a seizure on your PC, you might not even notice. And if I tell you in advance, you might delete everything. Well, you know, you, you, you cannot burn your house when you go receive the notice. So it's complicated because things change shape and we need to have regulation and adapt and evolving to ensure that we have the right balance between rights and, and, and Laws, uh, principles, and laws, as he was mentioning before. That's why we are doing this uh, Internet Bill of Rights. Uh, the, the same after Charlie Domi in France, both France and Italy started with uh, a, a new bill that had some provisions in it that allow for a seizure on a PC without the user knowledge, meaning that a judge could decide, a judge is okay if it's a judge that decides, could decide that the police enter your PC and took everything that's contained in it. That passed in France and that did not pass in Italy. Okay? Uh, and did not pass because we opposed to it, because we said, hey, listen, you have all your uh, ICQ, oh, ICQ, your MSN messages in there telling, uh, What's the color of your hair today? I and mean, it's different than the documents you have at home. You have the whole history of a person in there. And so there must be some proportion. And we need to think of warranty mechanisms in order to do this. Allowing law enforcement to make the seizures and so be able to have access to all the stuff. But not every all, not all, but just what is relevant. And allowing the, the fact that you don't, you cannot delete it because I, when I know I notify it, it's very complicated. We need to find out some algorithms, some technologies in order to be able to do that. And we are now presently working on that, so it's complicated. Any other question? I think we have to stop anyway. It's too late. So thanks again to Stefano Pitarelli for this class. Uh, let's break for. Uh, 12 minutes, uh, please sign if you haven't yet signed for these lectures. And yeah, thank you again. Thanks.